So good morning, everyone. We are going to start our conference with the land acknowledgement. And it's my honor to introduce Earl Lambert. And Earl is our keynote speaker this morning, and he has traveled all the way from beautiful Dawson's Creek in BC to be with us today. So welcome, Earl. Thank you very much, Barb. It's actually Dawson Creek. It's not the television show Dawson's Creek. <laughs> I get asked that a lot. Well, good morning, everybody. So uh, we begin this um, event by acknowledging that we are on a land that has been inhabited by indigenous people for thousands of years. We acknowledge that the uh, Brantford community is located on traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and the adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. This is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work, live, and to play on this land. Hi, hi, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Earl. So it is my honor to welcome all of you here this morning to our Ignite the Flame conference. We are here to celebrate you and to celebrate the most important work you do every day, which is providing quality early learning and childcare. You are all heroes and you make a difference in the lives of children every day. We're here to celebrate that and thank you for coming out today. You will not be disappointed in the conference that we have planned for you. I would like to say a few thank yous. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Ministry of Education and the City of Brantford, Children's Services and Early Years for this generous funding which made this all possible today. And in particular, I would like to thank Michelle Connor for your leadership and for all of your ongoing support. And also Karen Callaghan, who couldn't make it here today from the Ministry of Education. When leaders believe in you, you can accomplish anything. I'd also like to thank um, my team, the Early On Community Living Brand. Could I please have you all stand? Oh, they're, okay, they're still at the registration table. I would like to thank my team for all of the behind the scenes work that they did. It was outstanding, and we couldn't have done all of this work here today without their help. Thank you, Early On team. I'd also like to thank my director is here today, Risha Burke. She's here at the back, and I'd like to thank her for her ongoing guidance and support in my role. Thank you, Risha, for coming this morning. So our conference committee set the following goals for us today, and we are confident that we are going to achieve those goals. So the goals that we set are, you are gonna to leave today from this conference feeling rejuvenated. You're gonna feel inspired. You're gonna feel a sense of camaraderie with your colleagues you work with. You're gonna learn something new. You're gonna feel appreciated for your important role. As Dr. Jean says, you are the builders of brains, and you are. But most importantly, what we want you all to do today, you have a whole day to relax and sit back, and most importantly, have fun. Now, just a few little housekeeping things to share with you. Uh, all of our washrooms are exclusive today, even including the men's, uh, just because we want to make sure we all have uh, um, services available. And don't forget to check the door prize charts in the lobby. They will be posted to the right on the glass walls and um, to see if you've been winners, because the door prizes will be drawn after our keynote from Earl, Earl Lambert. So now I would like to introduce Sandy Garens from Lansdowne Children's Center 
and she is going to introduce our dignitaries to bring greetings. Thanks, Barb. Although Karen Callaghan from the Ministry of Education was unable to be with here today, she wanted to pass along her very best wishes to all participants for a successful day of networking, learning, and celebrating the wonderful things that you do every single day. Here to bring greetings from the County of Brant is Mayor David Bailey. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, on behalf of my elected council of the County of Brant, I bring you greetings from the county. Um, seeing this many ladies and some, a couple of men uh, in a room like this is very scary business. Um, as most of you know, or a lot of you know, you know me. In my last life before I was the mayor, uh, you know that I, I, I hosted the Lansdowne uh, Christmas party for five years, sat on their board. I was at the Boys and Girls Club for 22 years, uh, and it was all about kids, it was all about policy, it was all about, uh, all about doing the right thing. And as I said, 22 years is a long time to be sitting on a board, so I, I watched a lot of kids grow up, and I, I remember those days with a lot of um, happiness. Back then, we had seven daycare centers, I believe, including, including the Three Bears. Uh, I also uh, did a lot of work with, um, um, back then it was Arc Industries. Um, I don't know what they call it now, but it was Arc Industries there. So I've dealt with all kinds of children, and I think what you do is amazing. You're very important people. I'm of the age bracket that we didn't have this kind of uh, schooling when I, was, uh, when I was small, when I was young. And back then we, we, we fell back onto our cousins and our brothers and our sisters. And I'd like to mention that my sister is here today, Dana, who works in St. George, who I love very much. And, and she, uh, she does wonderful work with the kids in St. George. So, so I think you're very special. I know you're very special because I've seen the results of what you do. Um, I also, back in 1971, I opened a, a camp on my own in Branchton. And back then, the terminology was YACMAR, which was Youth Across Canada for the Mentally Retarded. And I know that that's not an appropriate handle these days, but that's what it was called back then. And I was the Brant for Brant representative, and I started a camp, which is still there, um, for, for kids with disabilities long before Lansdowne's programs were in, in place. And it holds a great big piece of my heart uh, when I see the kids that are still, well, the kids that are still here that are now 55, 60 years old. And, and I hope that what I did for them back in 71, I hope they remember. I hope they remember the, the hay rides and the greased pigs and all the things we did to entertain kids when there was no restrictions and you just had to, you had to count on your, your common sense and your safety sort of went out the window a little bit, but all the kids did was have fun all the time. So I believe in what you do. I am so proud of all of you. I respect what you do, and you always have a friend in the County of Brant. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Mayor Bailey. On behalf of all the early learning educators here today, please accept this as a reminder of all the wonderful work we do within the county and the city of Brant to um, service our youngest citizens and families. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor D uh, Kevin Davis um, from the city was unable to attend today, but he does send his well wishes for a wonderful day today. And now it's my honor um, and privilege to introduce Errol Lambert, um, our keynote speaker for today. He's a Cray Mete warrior who continues to live out his passion as a motivational speaker and inspirational storyteller. Earl's a certified life coach who attended the University of Northern British Columbia, where he, accept, where he majored in commerce with a double minor in First Nations studies and political science. A successful entrepreneur, he's currently the CEO and president of three companies, Warrior Spirit Productions Limited, WSP Property Investments, and lastly, Proud to Be Apparel, an increasingly popular clothing line that continues to sell in several countries across the world. He lives with a great sense of pride as an Indigenous role model, paving a way for a brighter future. 
He continues to gain strength from the spiritual teachings of his elders and is well known not only for his powerfully upbeat energy, but for his positive and optimistic outlook on life. Driven by his passion to motivate others toward making positive life choices and living out their dreams, he remains committed to inspiring others with the gift of his words, and he's here today to inspire us. Let's welcome Earl Lambert. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Sandy. So when I'm in British Columbia, I'm known as Earl Francis Lambert. When I go to Quebec, I become Earl Francois Lambert. So I like my name, it's a little more exquisite on the east side. So I wanna say thank you very much to Sandy and Barbara Van Every for giving me the, Van Rie for giving me this opportunity here today to speak, to motivate, and to share my inspiration with each and every one of you. I'd like to start off by giving them a big round of applause, please. I would also like to give yourselves a big round of applause for being great educators, professionals, and givers of care to our young people. And last, but by no means the least, the people behind the scenes, the technical and sound people as well as the caterers, and everybody who helped this function to come together, the cohesive glue, let's give them a big round of applause, please. So I thought I'd start off with a couple jokes for you teachers out there. Just short ones. And they're probably called dad jokes, so. Not many dads in the audience, but there's a lot of moms, I can see that. So, um, what does an ECE educator and a turkey have in common? Well, by the end of November, you're both completely cooked. <laughs> <laughs> Why was the ECE teacher's eyes crossed? Because they couldn't control their pupils. <laughs> it's a couple of silly jokes. So in our Cree language, we would say, which is, thank you very much, hello, my friends. Um, as you can see behind me, um, I have shared with you all the medicine wheel, the teachings of the medicine wheel, which according to our culture was the catalyst for passing on teachings and is inherent to who we are as indigenous people. It's not something that you just see up on a screen or on a piece of paper. It's something that we lived and we breathed and was done with uh, a lot of kinesthetic exercises. Um, so it was practical and hands-on learning. And using the wisdom, oral traditions and oral histories, we would pass on the teachings, we would teach about science, we would teach about problem solving, we would teach about uh, holistic health and well wellness and well-being, the creation of Mother Earth, the formation of the elements. There are so many teachings, it's rich, it's powerful, and I love sharing on it, so I thought I would start right now, because you are all involved in the very, very fundamental stages of our children's growth. The job that you do is absolutely paramount to their health and their future and their well-being. So, as you can see from the medicine wheel up here, and I'm just gonna move my laptop up top. All right, so as you can see up here, there's a lot of the religious teachings that when children are born, they are born into sin. You know, and in order to be saved from sin, they need to follow the religious way of life, whatever path it is that they choose. But according to our culture, our children are born innocent. They're born innocent and they're born secure. Um, curious and their curiosity is their innocence because they want to know they have a need to know they want to experience right and if we don't teach them the right way right then that kid can learn what's called shame and in our culture we never knew what shame was we made mistakes we learned from them and we moved on but unfortunately due to residential schools we have a lot of shame instilled into our our people right and those practices continue on um, from one generation to the next generation has now become intergenerational, as you know. And so their innocence and their, security, their, their curiosity, right, it's really important for us to know that. So one thing that we would do as indigenous people is we would put um, the baby inside of a baby bundler or a moss bag or a tikkanagan or a papoose, right, and that's so that they would not be distracted by the outside world. And this is part of the hunter-gatherer uh, hunter caregiving model, which at one time was dismissed, but is now being brought back and actually being recognized and honored. So they found that 
they had a better attention span if they were not distracted by the outside world around them without the free range. So keeping the baby within helped them stay connected to their spirit, helped them internalize and to think and to analyze what was happening around them, and they weren't distracted by everything around them. We didn't have iPads or um, the, the, all the uh, devices that we have today that caused a lot of distractions for the kids. Um, also, it was a close connection to the parents while they were sleeping. You know, so we knew that if we stayed close to kids, it's been proven through research that they grow with more confidence, security, and they experience more life success if they stay closer to the parents while sleeping. They would sleep between the mother and the father, and it would connect with the feminine and the masculine energies. Um, we use oral traditions, oral histories, oral legends in order to pass. And that was language that was close connection to the spirit. And the richness and depth became watered down when translated to English, unfortunately. So a lot of our oral traditions are oral histories because indigenous people were forced to speak English within residential schools, right, in order to be assimilated. Unfortunately, a lot of the oral histories, oral traditions, the richness of it was lost when it was translated into English. And because we don't have a lot of um, of a lot of speakers today. We're still trying to revive the language and bring it back, and we're hoping to bring back those teachings. But it was through stories, storytelling, right? And using our own life experience, our own wisdom that we taught our young people. And as you can see within the medicine wheel, on the uh, right side, which would be the east, the yellow, from infancy and toddler and the child, the infancy and the elder, so it starts off with infancy, it goes to toddler, child, teenager, young adult, adult, then grandparent, elder, and then does life just stop? Does that circle just cease to exist? I ask you that. No, it continues. So in our, in our culture, after they reach the elder, they don't just die and that's it. They go to the spirit world. And then there is a rebirth. And then they re-enter this world in a new cycle called reincarnation. So they'll walk many, many lives. Like how many of you ever met a child that seemed like they had a really old soul? Like knowledge beyond their years. Or they talk to people that aren't there. They have conversations with people that aren't there. Yes. So, or they give you insightful, they say insightful things to you that resonate with you. And you walk away thinking like, where did that come from? Right? It's because they have a close connection to the spirit world in our culture. Right, for the first five years, they're close to connect to the expert world. They can see things and experience things that we cannot because we become distracted as we grow. And so, for children, um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. But also, the elder and the it and the children are very closely related in that cycle. And so, there is huge, huge. Um, importance in keeping the elders and young people close together. How many of you know children that were raised by their grandparents? Are those, do those children usually experience less behavioral problems? Do they usually advance or mature at a mental or emotional level, you know, at a healthy level? Do they do well being raised by their grandparents, do you think, versus being raised by their parents? I ask you that. So in indigenous culture, we find that a lot of the children who do grow and flourish, right, and succeed in life are the ones who are raised by their grandparents. And it's because there's that kindred connection between the young and the old, right, that helps to ground them. But also, you know, when it comes to um, the Western world, we know from age five, a child's brain develops more than any other time in their life. So their mind is very fragile. When a child is born, they don't have judgments or criticisms of themselves. They don't look in the mirror and go, does this diaper make me look fat? <laughs> or why did I get dad's nose? I like mom's nose better. <laughs> you know, their self-esteem and their confidence is not affected, right? And if they're taught to grow, you know, if they're taught good self-esteem, if they're taught with good words and with healthy practices, they grow and flourish and that brain develops in a really healthy way because at, by the age of five, 90% of their brain has been developed and formed, right? Um, the average baby's brain is about a quarter of the size of the average adult brain. And I know a lot of you probably know this, but I just find this stuff fascinating myself. So um, at birth, a baby's um, brain is about a quarter of the size of the adult brain. And then it doubles in size in the first year 
and it keeps growing to about 80% adult size by age three and by and 90% by age five. So it's nearly fully grown. So everything that you do is really, really important to their life, the whole life. As they make their way around that life cycle, everything that you're doing with them, the play, the teachings, the talking, the communication, the nurturing, the energy that you convey is absolutely important. So I honor, I really do honor the work that you do. It's absolutely amazing when I watch people working in different um, programs and services, because I've worked with other ECE teams, and I had my, my partner when I was in university, actually worked in um, the daycare at the university. You know, so I got to sit there, and I was just fascinated when I was waiting, watching the kids and seeing that connection. And we're gonna talk a little bit about people who have influenced you a little bit later. But um, what I wanna say is that the quality of a child's experience in the first few years of life, positive or negative, helps shape how their brain develops. So the early years are the best opportunity for developing the connections needed for many important higher level abilities. Things like motivation, self-regulation, problem solving and communication are formed in these early years, or they're not formed. It's much harder for these essential brain connections to be formed later in life, which we all know. And a child's relationships with the adults in their life are the most important influence on their brain development. Loving relationships with responsive, dependable adults are essential to a child's healthy development. And it is all of you here that help the brain to develop in a healthy way and help set the stage for their future success, for their future relationships, for their future learning, and anything that that child does later on in life. So I'd like you, please, once again, to give yourself a big round of applause. So, you're not babysitters. <laughs> you're, not, you're givers of care, you're educators, and you are professionals. In the first five years, the child brain develops faster than any other time in life. Quality of a child's experience in this stage of life helps shape how their brain develops. And loving relationships with responsive, dependable adults are essential to a child's healthy development. But in taking care of these children, you also have to take care of yourself. You have to acknowledge yourself. You have to understand and know that each and every day, the work that you do is absolutely important. That we respect you, but you need to respect yourself. They say respect is treating other people the way you want to be treated, but it's also treating yourself the way you tell these children to treat themselves. They say everything we need to know in life we learn in kindergarten but we just forgot somewhere along the way. So whenever I do my workshops, I do my keynotes, or um, I'm doing my teachings, I always keep it relatively light and simple because we know a lot of this information already. We just need little reminders and refreshers to kind of get us back on track. And that's absolutely why Barb has brought me here to do this today, to remind you to take care of yourself, to acknowledge yourself, to have gratitude for what you do, to know that the hard work and the efforts that you put forth each and every day is recognized and appreciated by the children that you work with. They will remember you for the rest of their life. They will remember you for the rest of their life. You are going to have a huge impression on them that will never ever leave them. And I've done this keynote at a couple other conferences, indigenous conferences, and I'll tell you right now, we have had tears shed inside because people remembered um, the people that, the educators that taught them how to work in the early childhood education field. And uh, I'm hoping today is going to be that kind of experience. So what are some things you do to take care of yourself? <clears throat> Let's share some knowledge with each other. What are some things you do to take care of yourself? Shower? <laughs> yeah, hey, shower, right? What's that? You write? I go home and I have a glass of wine. And the more that I work and the longer that I work, that glass of wine gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I've heard that one before. Okay, yes, Barb? You jog? Okay, so getting out and jogging. 
right? Yep. Over there. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. So meditation, yoga, living in the moment. They say the most spiritual thing you can do in life is be. Free your mind of the future, of the past, and all of the distractions around you, and just be in the moment. Anybody else? Music. Read. Read. Yes. And do you read like scholar books? Books that make you think really hard and concentrate until your brow is tight? No? Yes, fiction. You want to escape your mind and get lost in someone else's world. So you can forget about the stresses, right? And the daily life events. Okay, somebody else said something over here? Music. music. Yes, music is good for the soul. We all know that. Right? And the great thing about working with kids is they give you the freedom to dance. I remember going to the Aboriginal Head Start and doing a couple motivational talks. And I love doing my hip hop with them because the kids love to dance and they love to clap and they love to get into it and they energize me. What else? Pardon? Go to the river. Go to the river. Yeah. And what do you do down at the river? Do you drink? <laughs> yes, you know what? When I used to live in Brantford, I loved going down the Grand River along the jogging trail and I would stop with my boxer and I would just sit at the river and just watch the water flow. It was beautiful. And the great thing about nature is that trees, their primary function is to take in all the pollution and breathe out nice clean oxygen. So it's great to be surrounded by the trees, right, and nature when you're experiencing stress or you just need a reprieve from everyday life. What else? Pardon? Paint? Okay, so painting or drawing, what they would call art therapy, which has been proven for uh, cancer, people living with cancer, right? It really helps to alleviate stress and to help them think about anything but the sickness. And it well gives them a, an outlet to express. Someone said over here, fishing? Fishing, yep, getting out and fishing on the water, on the boat. Say it again. Spa. 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 Oh, a spa day. Oh, us guys don't know what that is. So I was kind of completely foreign. Huh? But no, actually, you know what? This guy does know. I get reflexology. I get deep tissue massage on a regular basis. I do Reiki at least every two months. Try to do it every month. Right? And uh, so I do understand. I do get pedicures. I made a mistake one time of going in and asking for a man a pedi. I thought a man a pedi was a pedicure for a man. And then they grabbed my nails and they started to, I said, no, no, I don't want my nails done. You asked for a man a pedi. Oh, okay, go ahead. And then they said, do you want any paint on it? I was like, no, I don't want no color. I'll just put some clear stuff on it, she said, just to make them look nice. So I said, yeah. And then I went to my next gig and his lady came up to me and said, your nails are really shining with that light on stage. <laughs> so I had to take and sand them down a little bit there. So. No more uh, manicures, but I get my pedicures. So spa day, yes, a spa day is a great way to do it. You know, they say that when you get a deep tissue massage, it alleviates the uh, cortisol levels in your body by around 30%. and actually increases the dopamine levels inside your body by around 30%. So it rids yourself of the negative and feeds you with a positive. And it's so great to sit there, you're talking about mindfulness when you're getting a massage and just to forget about everything, just to get lost. What else? Sleep, yeah, sleep is definitely essential. I'll tell you how yesterday after two hour late flight and then an hour to get my luggage at Pearson International and then getting here at about one o'clock in the morning, I'm extremely tired today. But I'm feeding off all your energy, so I hope you don't mind if I take advantage of you all right now for a little while. So these are essential things that we do to take care of ourselves, And it's really important that you do take care of yourself in doing what you do. Mental burnout is one of the hardest, absolute hardest burnout. That brain is, it's the motor, it's the engine. And if that motor and that engine gets overworked, that muscle gets overworked, it starts to burn out. And it's not just a matter of taking a spot, it's gonna revive you. When you reach mental burnout, it can last forever. It can last for a very, very long time and you can have a relapse in it. When you start to feel good and you push yourself, it'll hit you again. 
So it's really important that you alleviate and you know your limits, you stay within it and that you take care of yourself. Because like I said right there, you can't pour from an empty cup. And I keep forgetting it's right here in front of me on my laptop. I'm just not used to having my laptop on stage. So you got to take care of yourself because you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't give away what you don't have. So taking care of yourself is absolutely paramount, my friends. So, love yourself and love what you do. How many of you love what you do? How many of you love who you work with? How many of you love your coworkers? The organization you work for? And if you want to raise, they're watching you right now. <laughs> and how many have loved your management team and the culture that they create? You got to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, then you might as well find a new profession because you're merely just existing. You know what's sad? is I was reading about uh, Nicole and Elena Ceausescu, who in 1966 wanted to boost their country's population. So what they did is they made abortion illegal and they introduced Decree 770 to reverse the low birth rate and fertility rate. So what they did was they gave incentives for mothers. They're entitled to significant benefits the more children that they had. And if mothers had at least 10 kids, they were declared heroin mothers by the Romanian state. By the late 1960s, the population began to swell. In turn, a new problem was created by child abandonment, which swelled the orphanage population in Romania. So what they did is they said, we want to increase the population, have more children, we'll give you more incentives, we'll give you more bonuses, we'll recognize you more. So they started having more children, but unfortunately they couldn't look after these children. There was neglect, abandonment, and orphanages started popping up all over Romania. And what they found that many of these children, their mental and emotional um, maturity level was stunted. So many of them did not mature at the emotional and mental state that they should have. And, but they found in this one area, of Romania, the kids seemed to show a normal rate of advancement. And they thought, why? So they did some investigation. And what they found out was that there was a custodian, a, um, a janitor, that worked at a few of the orphanages in this area. And the janitor would mop and sweep and stop and pick up a baby, coddle the baby for a minute or two and sing, put the baby down, mop and sweep, clean, grab another baby, pick up the baby, coddle the baby for one to two minutes, sing them a song, and it would, she would do that every shift that she did. And it was just that one to two to three minutes of coddling, singing, touching, right, and showing affection to that baby that helped that baby and that, that child to develop at a normal rate. You know, so it's absolutely important, it is, that we nurture our young people, right? That we teach them that they're worthy. That we help them to grow and flourish with a good self-esteem, strong self-esteem, strong self-confidence. To believe in themselves and know that the world is a stage. Just like um, Shakespeare said, the whole world's a stage, right? And we are the directors. And we can create and design anything that we want in this life. You know, I was a kid who grew up with a very low self-esteem. I grew up with a lot of racism in the community that I grew up with, a farming community of Dawson Creek, right? And so I grew up with a lot of negative beliefs about who I was for being indigenous, for being an Indian, which we all know is wrong, number one. <laughs> We're not from India. And um, so I had all these negative, con these negative uh, comments made to me before being uh, an Indian. And I formed this belief that I was bad. Anytime I made a mistake, I was like, shame on you, you're bad. You know, and so I built the system of beliefs that I was bad. And so I just acted bad. That's all I did. And they say for a kid, attention, any attention is attention. Whether it be negative attention or positive attention, attention is attention. They will settle for whatever they want. You know, but there are teachers and educators along the way that took time to sit, 
to talk to me, to be patient with me, to understand and forgive me for the mistakes that I made, to let me know it's okay to be human. You know, and when I go back in my mind, when I was doing my healing journey, those were the people that came up as leaving a positive impression on me. People like yourself. When I was really young, I remember I fell from a bed, a bunk bed. Me and my brother had bunk beds. And um, I fell from the bunk bed. And this time we had um, an aunt. My auntie was staying over there and she's sleeping on the bottom bunk. And she picked me up and she put me in the bed with her and she sang this song to me. It was Farah Jaka, right? And she just sang that song. I mean, it might be the only song she knew, I'm not sure. And she wasn't French, so. Um, but I always remember that, right? And so anytime she came over, I would ask her, Auntie, can you cuddle with me tonight and sing Farah Jaka? You know? And so she would do that with me. And I'll always remember that because I'll always remember the feeling of love that she conveyed and the, the harmony, right, of her voice inside me. So when I had my son Donovan and my daughter Alyssa, that's exactly what I would do is we'd lay down and we'd sing songs together. But the other thing I would do is I'd read him stories. Donovan could be anybody he wanted to be when we went to bed. I would say, Donovan, what do you want to be tonight? I want to be Fireman Donovan. So then I tell a story about him being a fireman and rescuing somebody from a house or rescuing a cat from a tree and becoming a hero. You know, because I wanted to implant within his brain that he could be anything that he wanted to be and give him that inspiration, that experience in his life. You know, so it was, uh, it was something that I thought I would share with everybody here is just, you know, it's those little things, those few moments that you spend that can leave such a huge impression on that child. But what was your reason for becoming involved in the field that you're in? What was your reasons for becoming involved in early childhood education? I ask you that. And just put up your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll there we go. Your mom. My condolences for the loss of your mother. But your mother left that impression on you, right? And you wanted to carry on that legacy by walking in your mother's footsteps and to teach our young people in early childhood education. What's your mom's name? Melanie, Melanie Coleman? Well, let's give Melanie Coleman a big round of applause. Anybody else? What was your reasons for getting involved? Oh, sorry. My daycare providers when I was little. So your daycare providers when you were little. You can remember them? They're probably over at that table. <laughs> I did the math. I think my boss was also the big boss when I was little. So probably the same ones. So it was... It was your early childhood educators when you were younger that inspired you to get involved in what you're doing today. And you just want to continue following that, those footsteps. Of course. And who's some one person that stuck out for you? Uh, definitely Court and Debbie from Paris Child Care. Court and Debbie? Oh, yeah. All right, let's give them a big round of applause. Okay, somebody said something over here. Oh, is that the spa day lady again? <laughs> Say it again. The love of the children. Just be around them and help them grow and learn. The love of the children. Just the energy, right? And the love that they can fade. That innocence, like I said, right? And just helping them learn. And knowing that you can have such a huge influence and such a huge role, play such a huge role in their life, right? By starting them out right. Excellent. Round of applause for the love of the children, please. What else? Yes, over here. Um, to empower the future with love. To empower the future with love, right? All right, to empower the future with love, yes. Nurturing, education, patience, tolerance, kindness, compassion. Anyone else? This side's kind of quiet over here. If we're on the Titanic, we'd be sinking. Pardon? Go ahead. No. 
Conversations? The best conversations you ever had are with the children. Darn right, because you can be anything during that conversation. You can use your imagination in that conversation. You can be playful, you can be silly. They don't go, oh, another dad joke. <laughs> They're not that at that stage. So the conversations with the children. Okay, let's give a round of applause for conversations with the children. I really love walking around, but unfortunately because the speakers are in this setup, he said I'd get a huge feedback if I did. So usually I'm walking around with people. Anybody else? Oh, so you're not just teaching the children. You're learning from the children, so they teach you. So you love learning from the children, and that's why you got involved in what you do, because you want to learn from them. And in learning from them, that's qualitative data on how we can be that much better as early childhood educators, right? To improve, right on. Learning from the children. And back there. Oh yeah, every day is a brand new adventure, right? Always something to look forward to. How many of you agree with her? I know that was definitely with me because I was ADHD, so. Every day is a new adventure. What's Earl going to do today? Mm. One more person out there. I heard over here, I think I missed you. Learning how to teach discipline, right? And correct children properly to stop the shaming techniques, right? As a tool to teach them and to teach them in a good way. Yes, right on. To be able to correct the children in a good way. So if your job moves in alignment with your values, you experience more fulfillment. And from what I feel in this energy already, and from the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of the, the ladies in here, and I say ladies because I think only two guys, is that, is that you love your job. I can feel your passion. I can feel your love. And that helps me to feel better, knowing that our children are in your hands. What's the most rewarding aspect of your job? The giggles? The laughs, the smiles. Oh, you always get hugs from the kids when you go in there. They see you, oh, come running up. And someone said passion. When they problem solve or they resolve something, they're like, they get it. Eureka, I got it, right? So you celebrate with them. Yep. What else? What is Building trust and establishing trust with them. Yes. It's foundational for any relationship. Anyone else? Can somebody repeat that closer to me? Because it sounded funny, but I missed it. Oh, the kids are your boss. Oh, yeah. So the kids get to tell you what to do. But they're always happy when they do it, right? They're not like, I want out my desk by 5 o'clock. <laughs> okay, so having the playful and fun bosses, good spirited bosses. What else? The love and appreciation, yes, because it's not like politics where you're often criticized and never thanked enough, right? Early childhood education, right? They're always grateful, they're always appreciative, and they're always welcoming, like she said, with the big hugs. Yes? The cultural diversity and values, she said, that you learn. And you're not just developing relationships with the kids, you're developing relationships with the parents also, too. So you're broadening your horizons, right? 
establishing a, a large network. You're extending your family. Yeah, and you're making some good connections, right? Okay, so what's the most challenging part of your job? Now everybody will just start speaking up, watch. <laughs> okay, the parents can be a little bit of a challenge, what else? I told you, what is it about human beings? We gravitate more towards negative than we do positive. Right? So I ask, like, what are the rewarding aspects of your job? You get a few people over here. And you say, what's the most challenging? All of a sudden, everybody's talking. <laughs> so I would like everybody in here, please. What I want you to do is I want you to look around this room, and I want you to count everything you see that is blue. Just keep track of it in your mind. Everything you see that is blue. Okay, now stop. Everyone focus your eyes up here. I'm gonna ask one of you a question and when I look at you, I want you to look at me without looking away. What is your name, young lady? You both wanna be young ladies, eh? <laughs> What's that? Stephanie. Stephanie. Okay, Stephanie, without looking away, how many things did you see that were red? Answer now, don't look away. You were talking about disciplining, healthy discipline. Stephanie looked away. She did not listen to me. And then she counted how many things were red. At the time, how many things did you see that were red? I challenge you on that. None, why? Because you're focusing on everything that was blue, right? And the same is for the bad and the good in life the positive and the negative. If you're focusing on the negative, you're gonna find it, and that's gonna become your reality. But if you focus on the good or the positive, you're gonna find that too, and that becomes your reality. So your focus is what becomes your reality. And from what I've heard in here already, I've got a lot of very positive feedback about why you got involved in ECE, what the most rewarding aspects of your job were, you gave a big round of applause for your organization, for your coworkers, for the people that you work with, for the children, right? For carrying on the legacy of your parents, of your coworkers, and those who influenced you in a really good way. So it sounds like you have a really good focus in here, right? So remember that. When you wake up in the morning, what do you look forward to? And someone said, I look forward to every day is a new adventure because you never know what you're going to get when you walk through that door. I might be changing a, a poopy pants to getting a nice picture with my name on it, right? And a little scratchy, sniffy sticker <laughs> or something like that. So you said that your mother inspired you, right? And you said that the two ladies sitting over here inspired you when you're in early childhood education. Anybody else, who inspired you to get involved in what you do today? Yes? Your children. You want to be able to teach them better? Ah, so teaching your own children inspired you. And then you thought, I want to teach other children the same things I'm teaching my child, because I'm really good at it. And they seem to be listening, so why not make a profession out of it? Okay, let's give a big round of applause for her children. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Your younger brother. How's that? You wanted to be able to help other children to learn and to grow. So your little brother. All right, let's give our little brother a round of applause. Anybody else? Who? Ms. Brizzo? Oh, the Magic School Bus. I thought you were talking about Snoop Dogg. I heard full Drizzo. <laughs> okay, tell me more about that. She 
She made learning and science fun. It just seemed like a cool thing to do. So you were inspired by the, the magic school bus. All right, let's give the magic school bus a big round of applause. I'll tell you right now that my granddaughter, Ocala, she loves it when grandpa sings. She loves it when grandpa entertains. But in order for grandpa to really entertain her, I've got to compete with whatever's happening on her little iPad or on the TV screen because she's so zeroed in on it. So I got to become very animated. I got to be very loud. I got to use lots of different tone inflection. I got to do something to engage her, you know, and I love it. She really inspires me to be silly. And you know, one thing I realized was that as I was singing to her, I started writing songs and started doing little children's songs and stuff. So now, whenever I go out to different communities, everywhere I work, I do a half hour show with the, the um, junior kindergarten to senior kindergartens. I take in my guitar and I do my version of This Old Man with them, right? And I love getting them up and dancing around and clapping. And you know what, the thing is, they never forget me. When I go back there, you know, a few years later, they'll always remember me getting them up dancing and singing. So that's why I work with the Aboriginal Head Start. It's because my granddaughter, Ocala, got me really, really motivated to do that. So I want to hear more over here. So you said that the two people that inspired you are sitting over here. Two of the people that inspired you. Can I get them to stand up, please? All right, ladies, can you come over here for a second? So like I said, one thing you gotta do is you have to know how to dance and be silly, right? No, I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to get you up here dancing. Okay, so how many people in this room were inspired by Debbie and Courtney? Yeah. Debbie and Courtney. Put up your hand if you were inspired by these two ladies to get involved. Holy jeez. You've got a whole bunch of people behind that wall too. Okay, and what parts of how they were or how they um, performed their job inspired you? How long have you been doing this, Debbie? 31 years. 31 years. And yourself, Courtney? Like three months. <laughs> three months? No. In the new role. Oh, in the new role. In the new role. In the field overall, then? Uh, 14 years. 14 years and 31 years. You love your job that much, yeah. right? And it's your love and your passion for your job, right, that is conveyed to those children that you work with, to your coworkers, to the organization. Right? And it's that influence that you bring right here to everybody. If you could see all the hands that went up over there on the other side of that wall also. You have inspired so many people doing what you do. And I just want to say that on behalf of early on, on behalf of my organization, right? On behalf of all the children that you have worked with and that you've nurtured, you've provided for, you've educated, right? And you have taught the fundamental values, right? Morals. You know, and everything that the essence of what they need to know in life, you've done an amazing job. I'd like to give Debbie and Courtney a big round of applause, please. Yeah. They are. Thank you so much for Let's give them a standing applause, everybody, because these are trailblazers for you. What? Okay, so I'm good. I'm good. I'm on time still. We have a, a little joke amongst the indigenous community called indigenous time. <laughs> well, it's not on time. But where it originates from is because um, if we had to harvest, right, or if we had to plant, we had to go according to the seasons. 
So we could not get out there and harvest if it was not the right time. If the moon didn't come out on the time that we expected it to, didn't rise, or if the sun didn't rise at the same time it was expected to, then we had to wait to do the ceremonies or we had to wait to do whatever we wanted to do. So that's where the whole indigenous time came from. I don't know if any of you ever heard that before, indigenous time. So that's where it came from. And it was changing to something else. All right, so last but not least, what are you most thankful for? Gratitude is powerful. You know, I was taught many years ago during my healing journey, when I go to bed at night, name th five things that I am grateful for. And then along the way, I read a research study that they took six people who were moderately depressed. They got them to do a six-month study. They got some of them to listen to positively stimulating music, right? That would trigger certain parts of the brain and help them to feel good. To listen to it every day, and then the other um, participants, they got them to write five things they're grateful for every night before they went to bed. And three months into the study, they checked in with the participants, and they found out the people who listened to the popular stimulating music did show an improvement, right, in their overall mood and outlook. But it was those who wrote five things they're grateful for every night before they went to bed that showed a significant improvement in their overall mood, their energy level, and their outlook in life, their overall attitude had just improved. So an attitude of gratitude just de de definitely raise your altitude in life. So never stop being grateful for what you have in your life. Because when you appreciate life, life appreciates in value. You cannot open yourself up to all the beautiful stuff that life has for you and the beautiful things, the beautiful relationships, you know, until you're grateful for what you have right here right now. So maintain an attitude of gratitude and teach the children to be grateful. That's something that's inherent to us as indigenous people. We would offer tobacco to the animal for providing sustenance, to the plants, to the medicines, to the trees for providing lodging, to the sun and to the moon. We would give thanks. Whenever we opened up communion with an elder, we would offer tobacco to the elder and we would say, thank you for giving us the opportunity to sit down and talk to you for sharing your wisdom with us. You know, so we lived in gratitude. It wasn't until we started learning you know, about greed and we started learning about taking more of what we didn't necessarily need and about domination that that attitude of gratitude slowly started to dissipate. And then, of course, with residential schools, a lot of our, the value of gratitude was lost. But it's never too late to bring it back, to reinstill it inside of us. And what a better time than to teach them when they are young, when their brain is forming, to teach them the power of gratitude, of what they're thankful for. So I tell you right now, teach the kids to be grateful. Teach them to appreciate life and what they have and who they have in their life. And what I want you to do right now, everybody, is I would like everyone to do a table exercise with me. All right? Now, it's not an actual exercise. <laughs> it's just an activity. So what's going to happen here is I would like everybody, everybody hold up your left hand. Turn to the person to your left and shake their hand. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> okay, stop. I'm just joking. It was just a joke. <laughs> okay, everybody turn to the person to your right and rub their belly. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if the mayor, if the mayor was here, he'd be like, Okay, so what I'd like to do, the person on your left-hand side of you, you're gonna turn, someone's gonna start in this circle. You're gonna turn to the person to your left and you're gonna start and you're gonna give them a compliment. You're just gonna give them a compliment about who they are, about maybe their job conduct or just anything about them, about their appearance. One person's gonna start it and it's gonna start with one person at the table. So I need a volunteer from each table to put up your hand. A volunteer from each table. When I see one hand up from every table, we will begin. One hand from each table. Put up your hand nice and high, please. If you're short, stand on a chair. 
All right. Okay, so we got somebody from every table except this one here. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so you were going to start this. Shh. Do you want to hit the light switch over there? Okay, how about this? Raise your left hand if you can hear me. Raise your left hand if you can hear me. Raise your left hand if you can hear me. I always wanted to do that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so <laughs> one person's going to start who put his hand, their hand up, and you are going to turn the person to your left. You're going to give them a compliment. That person is going to look at you in the eye. They're not going to devalue that comment like we do. I like your hair, yeah, but they cut it wrong here and over here and start a bald up here and the breath's over here. And we start devaluing that. We're just going to say thank you. And then they're going to turn, they're going to pass on that energy to that person to their left until you go around the table and everybody is done. So, on your mark, get set, go. Ladies and gentlemen, are we done? Give yourself a big round of applause for sharing some kindness today. The great thing is about compliments is they're like hugs. When you give a hug, you can't give one without receiving one yourself. And when you give a compliment to somebody, not only do they feel good, but you feel good, knowing that you've made a difference in someone's day. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to conclude my keynote presentation. I hope that I have inspired you. I hope that I've motivated you to keep doing what you're doing. And I hope that I've reminded you of how important it actually is every day, the work that you do. But I am going to do something for you, which I originally wasn't going to do. But I'm going to do one of my comedy songs. So I'm known as like the weird Al Yankovic of indigenous parodies. So I've got songs on Facebook that have had millions of views, but it's indigenous-based humor, right? So you gotta understand like the ins and outs of indigenous humor, like fry bread and snagging, that's what is like dating, we call it snagging, right? Or shacking up, which is moving in with each other, right? Things like that. So this song is called Pow Wow Drum. And this song is important to me because I wrote this song for indigenous people, National Indigenous People's Day in 2018. I released it on that day. The singer of the song, which is called Lonely Drum by Aaron Goodwin, he's a Nashville recording artist. The parents got a hold of me because I used his backtrack for it. And they said, we remember when Aaron wrote that song and he came upstairs with the guitar and he's so excited to show us it. And then when he went to Nashville to record it and it became such a big hit, we were very, very proud of him. So can you give Aaron a shout out on your Facebook? Because it took off like wildfire. So I said, yeah, I gave him a shout out. Aaron Goodwin gave me a shout out on his Nashville fan page and actually shared my parody on his page. So it's the first time an artist has actually acknowledged the work that I do and shared it. So this is called Pow Wow Drum. So we're gonna kick it off. Please sound. Have a lot of fun. 
all very much. You've done a great job for the job that you do each and every day with our young people. You're amazing. So now I'm going to do a farewell song. I'm beating on my power drum. A farewell song will send you back now. Before you leave, come sit with me. We'll eat one last pan of taco. a hickey on your neck so all the drummers know that you're taking Anytime you hear my drum remind you of the night we cremated Out of a gloom, gloom, gloom Come sit on the grandmother moon, moon, moon We can ride a new love to, to, to And then we can I hope you have a great day and enjoy the rest of your conference.